Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. All right, I have some great news to report at the top here. The recordings of all the CanMed 2022 presentations and panel discussions have been added to the CanMed archive. Head over to canmedevents.com to check out more than 20 hours of new content. Yes, we did the math. While you're at canmedevents.com, be sure to sign up for email alerts. As I said last episode, we're working hard behind the scenes, getting ready to announce details around our CanMed 23 event. The higher-ups won't let me give away too many details, but trust me, this is an event you won't want to miss. And if you're signed up for email alerts, you will be among the first to receive word. My guest this week is Heather Grab. Heather is a senior lecturer at Cornell University's School of Integrated Plant Science, where she delivers best practices for the cultivation and processing of hemp to professionals in Cornell's Hemp Science MPS program. She works with plant breeders, pathologists, biochemists, extension professionals, regulatory officials, and industry partners in New York State and across the globe to translate the latest science and industry insights into a curriculum that covers hemp from soil to sale. So it should come as no surprise that our conversation covered a wide range of topics related to hemp cultivation. Those topics include how Heather got involved in studying hemp, an overview of the Cornell University Hemp Research Program, Heather's research into integrated pest management in hemp, in particular, finding out which pests are most harmful to outdoor hemp plants. We also talk about the wide variety of hemp varieties that Cornell grows in their field trials and how they prevent male fiber crops from pollinating the cannabinoid-rich plants. We discuss what is preventing hemp from displacing other legacy crops, how pollinators, specifically bees, interact with hemp plants, how frost and other stresses affect cannabinoid levels, and much more. But before I get to my conversation with Heather, I want to thank this episode sponsor, Conception Nurseries. Conception Nurseries, the world's largest micropropagation lab, brings proven agricultural technology to cannabis with tissue culture technology. To date, cannabis cultivators have been dependent on mother plants to produce clones, resulting in inconsistent harvests with diluted and uncontrollable traits. Tissue culture technology, which is widely used in industrial agriculture to address the exact problems cannabis cultivators face today, allows conception to quickly mass produce identical disease-free plantlets with customized and consistent characteristics. For more information, visit conceptionnurseries.com. Okay, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Heather Grab. Good afternoon, Heather. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. All right. Well, I'm excited to talk with you today about hemp science and specifically about the work you're involved with at Cornell University, which is one of the leading academic institutions in the U.S. here um, studying the plant. So first, I was hoping you could tell the audience a bit about yourself and how you got involved with hemp research and how you ended up at Cornell. Sure. Happy to give a brief intro to myself and then to talk a little bit more about our program here at Cornell. My academic background is actually in entomology, so the study of insects. I did a lot of work with small farms in the region for my PhD, focused on crop protection and developing integrated pest management solutions that would also be beneficial for crops that rely on other insects for services, including pest control and biological control, which greenhouse growers can rely on to help suppress their pest populations, but pollinators as well. I did a lot of work 
with wild pollinator populations. And that is actually, interestingly, what got me interested academically in hemp and cannabis research. So when we first started producing industrial hemp here in New York State, our team leader, Dr. Larry Smart, was fielding a lot of calls from our grower collaborators in that very first year or two, asking why they were seeing so many bees in their fiber and grain hemp crops. So as somebody who is an entomologist with a strong interest in bees, uh, he sent me an email and I was like, great, I would love to get out there to hemp fields. I had um, a student who was working with me that summer, Nate Flicker, on his uh, senior thesis project. And he made that sort of what his focus was for the rest of the year. And we went out and surveyed the pollinator communities on industrial hemp to see what the bees were doing out there. And after sort of getting that experience in the field with hemp, there was an opportunity for me to join our hemp team here full time to teach and mentor students in our professional master's degree program that has um, a whole ability for students to focus on a hemp and cannabis track within that degree program. And so I leapt for that opportunity, which is um, how I joined our broader hemp team here at Cornell. It's truly a privilege to be part of this community at Cornell that includes academics like myself who focus on teaching, communicating, doing research, as well as extension educators who are sort of this interface with the grower community in the state to help solve problems that they have and to build the industry. So that's a little bit of the overview of myself and the broad research and education program that we have here at Cornell. Excellent. Um, and I do want to get into some more detail about the work that you've done with the pollinators in hemp. But before we do that, I do want to talk a bit about the program at Cornell. So um, I was wondering if you could give a little more detail in terms of, you know, what does the program cover and kind of what makes it unique from other programs that are, are going on? I'm glad you asked that, Ben. We have a broad array of different educational opportunities in hemp and cannabis. We recognize that there's a ton of interest in this space and we want to help support and build the industry by providing knowledge and helping companies and individuals to answer questions that they might have, whether they're interested in starting a new business in the hemp space or if they just want to know more about the plant as a consumer. We have a, a huge range of options. So of course, there's sort of the traditional student option for undergraduates, uh, where they are already going to be participating in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. As an undergraduate student, they can take many of the courses that we have developed. But we also uh, began offering a few years ago this specialized track that focuses on hemp and cannabis in our professional master's degree program. So we developed a suite of five different courses. There are, we're considering many new ones all the time, but we have a broad industry overview course called Cannabis Biology Society Industry that draws from all over the university, law school students, business school students, hospitality students, of course, ag sciences and biology students take that class. I teach a course on production systems, also in the fall semester that covers everything from cultivar selection and site selection all the way through all of those cultivation practices that students need to know about propagation, how you treat plants in the field, whether you're going to make decisions about pruning and trellising your plants, harvest timing choices, uh, planting density, which is critical for industrial hemp cultivation practices. Uh, we have courses in the spring semester that focus on the processing of industrial hemp. Uh, we also have classes that focus on breeding and genetics of hemp and also, of course, on the pharmacology of the plant. So how the compounds within the plant interact with our own 
unique biology and that of other organisms. So in, including things like veterinary applications of some of these hemp derived molecules. So huge suite of different classes. And one thing that I'm really excited about is that we are now beginning to offer some of these classes in an online format. So the two options that I talked about before, those are degree granting programs. So either a traditional bachelor's degree where you might take a series of courses and concentrate in hemp uh, for your you know, undergraduate studies, or our professional master's degree program, where you're focusing on these classes and then building your own independent project, often with our industry partners to solve a problem. But we're also beginning to offer these classes online in a partnership with eCornell. So we already have Dr. Larry Smart's hemp breeding and genetics class that's launched on there. My hemp production system and my hemp processing courses will be the next to go up. We're working really closely with our industry partners to hear what they think are the most critical skills and areas where we can provide education. So those might be things like analytical lab skills, which is incredibly important for this industry, or integrated pest management. So we might develop future classes that focus specifically on those topics in particular. Yeah, and it's it's interesting you mentioned integrated pest management, and I it stuck out to me too when you were kind of talking about your background as well, because that's something that we're seeing, at least on our side, with medicinal genomics pop up more, because obviously we're involved in the microbial testing of sort of the end product. And, you know, one of the things that's coming online is irradiation, which we're finding has all sorts of different issues. And one of the alternatives to remediating your product that's that's contaminated is sort of preventing that on the front end, which I, as I understand it, IPM can really help with. So um, how much work have you done with, with IPM on hemp and what are some of the, some of the things you've learned? Um, I have actually a grant right now with my colleague, Marion Zuffel from New York state IPM. So we actually have this broad IPM program that's supported by the state and housed at Cornell university to establish what's called a crop profile for hemp. So this is the foundational material that IPM practitioners would be able to look at to understand crop schedules, um, cultivars that are used, what kind of production practices are cultivators using in the system, and really importantly, at this early stage of development in the industrial hemp and in the outdoor production, to also see what pests are going to be most critical. I think we have a relatively good idea of what pests are most causing issues in greenhouse and indoor production. But as we cultivate more hemp outdoors, especially grain and fiber hemp, learning what those issues will be and trying to be aware of the broad array of different issues that can occur across the full life stage of hemp. So things that attack those early germinating seeds out in the field, like pythium, for example, mm -hmm. or head blights that can cause uh, the buildup of mycotoxins in grain production and where what regions of the country are those likely to happen, or even issues like pests of um, um, birds, for example, that may be eating grain. That surprisingly is a very large issue here in many of the research farms that we work on. There's farms that we just don't plant on because the bird pressure is so high that we lose a substantial portion of our grain crop to birds every year. So just understanding what the landscape is. Um, so that's a project that we have funded that will hopefully complete over the next year with the help of some of our professional master's students who might take on a portion of that as their capstone project that they complete in the course of their degree. Excellent. Well, when you, when you finish that project, I look forward to having you back on to talk about that. Um, I know one of the other things that, that you guys do, and I saw that you just posted about this, it was either this week or last week, is you have a field day um, where you sort of present all the field trials and, and things that you guys have been working on throughout the year. Tell us a bit about that and what do you have planned for 2022? Sure. So 
Um, my colleague, Dr. Daniela Vergara, is taking the lead on organizing our field day this year. This is sort of um, one of the main feature days where we highlight the research and uh, the work that we're doing as a hemp team here at Cornell. So I think one of the things that makes our entire team unique is that we have so many different experts from across a broad range of disciplines who are all leveraging their unique insights, skills, and connections with their industry partners to help us build solutions that are uh, really right at the point where growers need them. And having the opportunity for growers to come out and actually see what we're doing in the field is so critical. So Daniela um, and her colleagues in Cornell Cooperative Extension have been doing a great job of putting together a schedule of speakers for that event that will include pathologists who will talk about the kinds of diseases and issues that we're seeing in the field across multiple different market classes, whether that's grain, fiber, or high cannabinoid hemp. We will have, of course, Marion and myself there talking about insect issues. Uh, we will have our breeders there. Graduate students are frequently also presenting some of the projects that they are working on. So I think a personal highlight for me is always seeing our cultivar trials out there in the field. There's nowhere else I think you can go where you can see as many different cultivars of hemp being grown in one place. So we have a huge array of different cultivars that we include in our high cannabinoid outdoor trials, but also grain and fiber cultivars. So I think this year, whether uh, as long as the weather cooperates with us, we will have some demonstrations on harvesting fiber hemp. We'll talk about some important processes that are enacted by beneficial microbes in the process of redding fiber hemp out there. So you really get to see that full experience. You're welcomed to touch the plants, to get out there, to smell them, to see what we're seeing in the field um, on this field day. So it's a great, it's a really great experience for those who can make it to our Agritech campus in Geneva, New York. Awesome. Now, in the pri is the primary audience for that event, like growers, like maybe folks who are looking to get into the industry and are, are trying to learn as much as possible? Um, I certainly encourage growers to come out. Of course, we try to think about things that are most relevant for growers. However, it's a great place also for processors to be so they can understand what some of the issues are that growers are seeing on the field. So for example, if you're a fiber hemp processor, it's beneficial for you to be there so that you can understand and help to guide the partners that you're working with on the production side, things like cultivar choice or harvest timing or post-harvest issues that they might encounter. Same is true for the high cannabinoid market as well. So it's great for them to get out there, see what those plants look like in the field in our cultivar trials, what kind of practices you mentioned before, some issues with microbial contamination, what, what are the things that we can do in terms of biological controls that may be really helpful in preventing issues like botrytis or powdery mildew that can occur either in the greenhouse or in the field? And how might some of the applications of those crop protection materials influence downstream processing? Last year, we had great attendance um, by folks who are on the analytical side as well. We usually also bring in uh, regulators who can help us to understand the current regulatory landscape, which is always sort of in flux, it seems. There's always new changes that are happening at you know, the USDA level or the state level within our program. So making sure that we're really actively communicating all of the different reports that growers need to be processing and thinking about all the licenses that they need to acquire to be successful. Excellent. And now you mentioned this, this huge array of different cultivars and some being grown for cannabinoids, some being grown for fiber. What is sort of the mix there in terms of the focus of the research there at your program, though? Is it primarily focused on, on the cannabinoids or is it fiber? Because I know at least when you look at a lot of the folks who are, are growing it commercially, 
Mm -hmm. It tends to be a lot of cannabinoids. Yeah, and I would say that's very true. In New York State, our production has very much been dominated by high cannabinoid hemp in terms of overall market value, acreage, most of the markers you would look at. Of course, cannabinoid hemp has been dominant and that has been a feature of our program. But we also have a lot of research on the ground to help support the development of the industrial hemp industry. So I would say we have a fairly even distribution, but of course there's, you know, I mentioned before, we have this broad range of expertise within our program. So Dr. Neil Matson, who leads our controlled environment agriculture program, so focuses mostly on greenhouse and indoor cultivation strategies. Of course, his lab has been focused almost entirely on high cannabinoid hemp production. There was a little bit of uh, baby leaf hemp that went on um, in yeah. indoor cultivation. So some interest in these like specialty niche markets, but I would say we're very much interested in exploring and supporting all aspects of the hemp industry. Excellent. And so, you know, we, we mentioned that a lot of the commercial uh, environment is, is really focused on cannabinoids. And so I have to ask this for any time I talk to anyone who's focused specifically on hemp is, you know, why do you think hemp really hasn't lived up to this, this promise of it being a super crop that's going to replace all these other legacy crops? It's an excellent question. Um, of course, we, we do hear a lot of hype. Um, and it seems like things change all the time, what it is that we're excited about with the crop, whether it's carbon sequestration or replacing other crops that might have a higher level of environmental impact through pesticide use or through use of limited water resources in some regions. And I think Hemp is beginning to make inroads in many of these areas, but making sure that all of those pieces of the supply chain can come together in a coordinated fashion is a major barrier to the development of the industry. And that's part of where extension services and where um, academia can help to come in and to support some of the creation of knowledge. So, for example, uh, you know, speaking with our industry partners who work in um, food applications, they're really excited about using hemp proteins as an alternative to animal-based proteins or even to other plant-based options. So, for example, um, almonds and cashews, which are frequently used in these plant-based alternatives don't necessarily have the greatest profile in terms of either sustainability or their social equity impact. So having hemp as an alternative is great. However, we have to build the knowledge for how to process and how to handle those ingredients so that, you know, of course, we don't want uh, to drink a hemp milk or have a hemp ice cream that tastes exactly like you're eating hemp hearts. We want it to taste like the chocolate flavor or the coffee profile that is supposed to be there. And for other proteins, we have a lot of knowledge about how to incorporate those into food products. So we have food scientists here who are working really closely with our plant breeders to help to develop cultivars that can meet those specific needs for the industry. Same is true when it comes to industrial fiber applications. I think a big issue in grain, which I'm sure, you know, other um, podcast interviewees have probably mentioned is the ability to use grain in animal feed. So the opportunity for that crop or some of the byproducts that come from grain to be able to be incorporated for poultry or for other uses is very important. So right now, Growers who are not able to market their crop into the human food market for whatever reason don't have any other option for where to offload that crop in order to perhaps recover some of the investment that they have. So if you're a soybean grower and you had planned to have some of your product used for soybean oil for human consumption, but for whatever reason you're not able to make it into that market space, of course, you have the options to offload that product in a number of other markets that we don't have developed yet for hemp. The good news is 
there's many different academic institutions and industry groups that are working to develop those different supply sources right now. So I think we will see hemp develop as a crop, but slow and steady will win the race. And having this integrated across the board knowledge base, whether it's developing the right cultivars for the right end uses or the right climates, having food scientists who are really familiar with the attributes and the qualities of these products all the way through the supply chain, that's going to be really important. Yeah. Well, I guess that makes a lot of sense that, you know, the cannabinoid sort of supply chain or processing chain, like that's, that's pretty well established. Um, but in order to sort of unseat some of these other, other crops that have had, you know, decades of refinement and, you know, optimization, uh, it's definitely going to take some time in order to get there. That makes sense. Um, and then I, I mean, from what limited knowledge I have, uh, as I understand it, just, you know, the actual processing equipment and the availability of that is somewhat of a barrier as well. And, um, you know, in getting ready for this podcast, I did see that Colorado, they just had a proposal up there to use $5 million of their cannabis tax collection funds to buy processing equipment for that reason too, to sort of help support uh, hemp growers in that state. Um, but unfortunately that got quashed. So how much of a barrier is sort of just processing equipment or processing facilities? Processing facilities are a, uh, a big challenge in terms of developing the industry. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg issue that we have in developing, especially the fiber side of the industrial hemp market. So for grain, there's a whole lot of infrastructure out there that's fairly easy to adapt to handle oil seed crops like hemp grain. Of course, there's some you know unique issues with incorporating those into food products that I mentioned before. But with fiber hemp, it's really about these very large capital investments in facilities. So $5 million is really a drop in the bucket when we think about what it costs to establish even one of these processing facilities. We are, are fortunate in that there are many companies who have already been gaining experience with fiber hemp processing, mostly in Europe. So a lot of equipment that was traditionally used to process flax in Northern Europe can be fairly easily adapted to handle fiber hemp as well. There's, um, of course, France has been cultivating fiber hemp and Germany on a large scale for a while now, but some of the companies, um, Crete's or La Roche, those companies that ha are producing this equipment, so building those individual pieces of equipment is a challenge right now due to supply chain issues, but even if it wasn't, a single piece of equipment from one of those companies can run anywhere up to $3 million, depending on the size and the type of processing equipment that we want to import. So that's a substantial investment. And then at the same time, those processors that are coming into that middle space in the market also need to be coordinating with the manufacturers who are going to take that processed material and convert that into a final product, whether that's a textile that goes on to um, use in clothing or automobiles or furniture, other sources, or an insulation product or a hempcrete block, something like that. And they also need to coordinate with the producers who are on the cultivation side, helping them to choose the right genetics and to make sure that there will be someone there. If they plant their crop, that in a couple months that there will actually be someone in place to purchase and utilize that crop that they have invested in. So that is sort of the challenge of building up this entire industry. Where do we start? Um, the Having that sort of middle processing component in place is very important, but it's also a fine line to walk for those who are investing in that space because they have to manage both sides of the market. But of course, they're also in a very unique place to have the opportunity to help to set the standards and to build that supply chain. So, wow. and so 
And now you mentioned different applications, whether it be for, um, you know, a textile or hempcrete or anything like that. So is the actual processing of the material different for those different applications? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so even in, in the textile space, there is processing equipment and even in the field harvesting methods that you would use if you want to produce a long textile fiber. So I have an example here. You can't see it, but it's, you know, a very long fiber. So the redding practices that you use, how you harvest it, you want to, of course, keep all of the individual stems parallel for that. So they're not all mixed together, how they would be, for example, for hay. So keeping everything parallel from the point of harvest all the way through processing is very important. The kind of equipment that you use, um, whether you're gonna do scutching and hackling, there's all these fun terms that come into play in the fiber hemp processing world. Um, the choices that you're making there are different than if you wanna produce what we might call cottonized hemp. So that is really short fiber hemp that could then be used for spinning. So if you're thinking about developing a 100% hemp t-shirt, you're going to go for a cottonized hemp product and the manufacturing line. The, so from the field processing line, it's going to look very different. It's similar. So I, I think a lot of your audience is really familiar with all the different choices you can make in processing high cannabinoid hemp. If you want to make a hash product, you're going to make a ton of different choices. You're going to select different cultivars based on their trichome architecture and development. You're going to take those plants, potentially freeze them right after harvest rather than dry and cure them. So all of those things are very different depending on the final product. And it's exactly the same for fiber hemp processing as well. Excellent. All right. All right. Um, so let's talk about bees. Because uh, I don't know, we're running out of time here, and I do want to make sure that we, we talk about that. So, um, tell us a bit about the research that you did looking into how um, hemp can support some of the pollinator population. Sure. So, um, Nate and I, when we took on this project, um, we were able to connect with a lot of growers who had formal collaborations with our university during the early days of our um, hemp production program here in New York State. All of our growers were um, essentially collaborating in some shape or form with our land grant universities to help understand what the challenges would be. So uh, we were welcomed to come and visit many of the farms across the state to see what their challenges were in the field, but also to see what opportunities hemp presented. And in this case, we found a huge array of different bee species that were visiting industrial hemp fields. And the reason that they were there was to collect pollen from male plants. So unlike cannabinoid hemp production, where you want a completely female field, so every plant would be female, in grain and fiber hemp production, we have mixed stands of both female and male plants, or in some cases, we even have monoecious plants, which means that they're actually selected to produce both male and female flowers on the same plant, which is uncommon for hemp generally, but we do see that happening. So they're out there collecting pollen. Hemp and cannabis generally produces no nectar for the bees. So they're really just there to collect that pollen. And they use that pollen, they collect it, bring it back to their nest, and then feed their developing offspring on that. Most people are, of course, really familiar with honeybees. And after we published this paper, we got a lot of buzz around maybe the ability to produce um, high cannabinoid honeys, for example. However, you know, while the bees seem to very much focus their foraging attention on hemp, even when other floral resources are available to them, in terms of the overall scheme of what they're bringing back to their hives, at least in a diverse region like we have here in New York State, it's pretty small. And the pollen, which does have cannabinoids in it, still at such a low level that you would really need to eat a substantial portion of honey in order to get even a, a small dose. I think I calculated out a 25 milligram dose 
of cannabinoids would take you about a thousand pounds of honey or more to just at the natural level. So that's not to say there aren't other folks out there who are experimenting with different methods of introducing cannabinoids to hives or sort of focusing more of the foraging effort of a colony on hemp and cannabis. But I would say if you're getting hemp honey advertised to you, it's almost certainly not something that's a naturally created process and spontaneous. It's most likely cannabinoids that have been added to a honey product after the bees were involved. So I'm still very much interested in beneficial insects, including bees that might be supported by hemp. Many of the bee species that we found, so outside of the European honeybee, of course, we have um, bumblebees, which are native here. We had a wide array of other small native bees that were using hemp, many of which are very important pollinators of other crops. So pollinators of tomatoes, apples, strawberries, blueberries, squash, pumpkins, all of these other really high value crops, which you know may be lacking floral resources on the farm at the period when those crops aren't blooming, and hemp can help to fill that gap. When there's no other flowers around, it can support some of those bees. Of course, we also need to be aware that it's not providing nectar. Um, so thinking not only about the resources that it provides, but also if we're gonna make crop protection choices, we need to account for the fact that there could be beneficial insects like pollinators there. And to think about that for even these crops that are not pollinator dependent, but maybe supporting a lot of beneficial insects as well. Yeah, so so what's the difference between pollen and, I mean, obviously there is a difference between pollen and nectar, but in terms of the bees, what, how do they use each? Oh, thank you so much for asking. I feel like I'm such a bug nerd that I uh, don't always think about what people who aren't as focused on bees and the floral resources and rewards that they provide are doing. So nectar is usually sort of that sugary secretion that often comes from the base of petals, for example. So hemp does not provide that. Many other crops, buckwheat, for example, is a crop that provides great resources. Goldenrod, which we have abundantly here in the Northeast, is an excellent floral resource that provides a ton of nectar. But pollen is really the key protein source for bees. So I mentioned before that bees are collecting all of that pollen and in the process of collecting, they're pollinating our crops. But that's really secondary in their objective. It's really not necessarily an objective of theirs at all, but they are actually collecting that pollen and bringing it back to their nests in order to feed their developing offspring. So the almost entire life cycle of a bee is spent underground in most cases 80 percent of bees nest in the ground or in their nest and they consume pollen as larvae and then develop into a bee so most of the time they're in this larval stage underground and it's only maybe a few weeks out of the year for most bee species that we see them in their characteristic bee form so really important protein source for them bees are actually sort of carnivores but focused on this uh high protein resource that's provided by plants so interesting and you mentioned that it seems like the bees actually prefer hemp to other you know flowers that may be in the area yeah we haven't done a big formal study of that but i was really shocked to have observed these that had many other floral resources available to them seemingly focusing heavily on the hemp crop. So in one of our large fiber trials last year, there was a ton of bees visiting that planting all day long, a large field of buckwheat planted right next to it. So I mentioned that's a crop that provides a great source of nectar, mm. very few bees on that crop. Um, fields of clover cover crop nearby, also a high protein source of pollen, very few bees. They were really excited about foraging on the hemp, potentially because the pollen is so much more easily accessible on hemp plants because they're releasing it onto the wind. So 
Um, I'm really interested to look, though, to see if there are potential benefits of having access to this unique floral resource, either because of its nutritional composition, high protein relative to other sources, perhaps, or if there are any effects of these cannabinoid or terpene molecules that may be present in the hemp pollen that could have beneficial effects for the bees. So bees don't have endocannabinoid systems like we do. Actually, no insects have the active CB1, CB2 receptors that typically is, you know, that's how we sense the effects of cannabinoids in our own body. Insects lack those, but that doesn't mean that they're not having other effects, beneficial or otherwise, on those insects. There's been some speculation about um, potential effects of cannabinoids in mitigating some of the diseases that we're really worried about in pollinator populations right now. So it would be great to have the opportunity to work with a student on a project like that. Excellent. Excellent. And now when you mentioned that, um, you know, when hemp is being grown for fiber or for, um, well, for fiber, that, you know, the concern about having males isn't as high, uh, obviously, because, you know, it's not going to produce seeds in, in your flower. So now I'm thinking back to your your field day at Cornell, where you said that you're growing both for fiber and for cannabinoids. So how do you manage how do you manage that and make sure that some of the male pollen or do you not grow males? So we absolutely have male plants in our grain and fiber trials. So for our cultivars that are not monoecious, so producing both male and female on the same plant, for grain production, we need those uh, male plants there to pollinate our female plants and to produce grain. In right. fiber, actually male plants have some benefits, so some positive attributes relative to female plants especially for textile production, they tend to have finer fiber structures on them. So we really do want to have a lot of males in our production for those plants. So what we do is we spend a lot of time coordinating among our entire research team. So we have, you know, we have this issue in many different flavors. So pollen transfer is certainly one, and we are lucky at Cornell to have a really large system of research farms spread across the region. So we have facilities on Long Island. We have facilities at our Agritech campus in Geneva, farms here in our Ithaca region, and then other research farms that are spread out across the state that can help us to achieve some separation. So of course, though, so at our Agritech campus, which is part of our research hub for cannabis and hemp, um, we have a lot of programs going on there interested in fiber, grain, and cannabinoid production. And so we try to space our plants around. Um, if you go to our page that talks about all of the research work that we do there, we actually did a study a few years back looking at how far pollen is likely to move and where that risk of pollination is. And so we do a good job of coordinating the placement of our different trials so that our fiber cultivar trial is not pollinating our high cannabinoid trials. We also work with industry partners who are developing new cultivars. So an example of this is the triploid genetics that are yep. being produced. Uh, so we are really involved in researching those cultivars and sort of giving them a really good pollen heavy challenge. And that was part of our field day last year. Those who came to the field, they could actually see these triploid cultivars grown in an, in an area right next to a large fiber production field where there was an incredibly high pressure of pollen and to see how well they perform in that environment. Wow, that's, that's really cool. All right, I've already kept you over the time that I promised, but I, before I let you go, I did want to um, just ask you, you mentioned that you work a lot with your students on on capstone projects. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity to to talk about some of the ones that have, have really stood out, or I know that you mentioned that uh, one of them just recently published. So uh, let's talk a bit about that. Sure, yeah. I would say that's um, one of the great privileges that I have in my role on the hemp team here at Cornell is mentoring our 
hemp uh, professional degree students in their capstone projects. So throughout the course of the fall and spring semester, and usually also into the summer, our students are working intensively on whatever area is really of interest to them. So I mentioned before, we have this really broad curriculum because we want students, especially who are in our professional master's program to really understand all components of the industry because we believe that's critical for helping to build a workforce and to build a well-integrated, strong industry. But we recognize also that students come with a desire to focus in particular areas, whether that's understanding lighting issues and what the most effective lighting practices are, or maybe processing and analytical challenges. And so each student sort of has the option to work with uh, industry partners and most critically with really strong mentorship from our faculty to help to design a project that they can tackle, which ideally addresses a challenge within the industry. And so um, the one that was just actually published today, uh, congrats to Andre Galich who led this project, uh, was based on an observation that Andre had with some cultivators who were working in Vermont. So back in, uh, it was probably the fall of 2019, that he was in dialogue with some growers in the Northeast that had experienced that fall a really hard frost just prior to harvesting their crop. And in some cases they lost their crop, in other cases they were able to recover some of that harvest, but they really were interested in understanding what impact that would have on their plants or what happens so as the climate becomes more variable, these frosts become less predictable. How, what would happen if that had happened earlier in you know, the early flowering stage? So Andre set out to design this experiment to help answer that question exactly. He grew out plants starting at different dates so that he would have an array of three different ages. He did some acclimation experiments where he allowed some of those to sort of come to this gradual cool temperature. And then some of those plants, as well as some that had not been acclimated, were exposed to different amounts of freezing. So some got one freezing for a few hours and some had consecutive multiple freezing stresses on them. He measured a whole bunch of plant stress responses, as well as looking at the final biomass that was produced by those plants in terms of the flower biomass, which is most important for our growers. And we also looked at how that might impact cannabinoid profiles. So some other work that has um, also been published out of our hemp team program here, led by Jacob Toth, fantastic experiment looking at how stress influences cannabinoid profiles. That was a big concern in the industry, especially when we think about that 0.3% uh, limit. There's been debate about bringing that up to 1%. And what he found is that Stress is not a big factor in driving plants above that compliance threshold of 3%. So he tested plants with herbicides, he did damage, he did many different things to stress these plants out and really underscore the fact that it's based on the plant's genetics that drive that change. So with cannabinoids, we also expected that to be the case with this cold stress as well. So what is the impact of cold stress on the changes in cannabinoid profile? Generally, not much. We see that, of course, there are differences among cultivars. But one thing we are concerned about in terms of frost, especially very late in harvest, is the potential to actually lose trichomes through physical impact on the plant. So, of course, if we're thinking about um, making an ice water hash, for example, we know when we get those trichomes really cold, they become very fragile. So that's something that we were also looking for in that publication. And I'll make sure to pass that on to you so you can include a link to that in your show notes. Yeah, I will absolutely do that. And no, that's interesting that stress doesn't seem to have, um, you know, a, a big impact on cannabinoids, but I'm curious, what about terpenes? Um, cause as I understand it, you know, terpenes can sort of be used to ward off pests or be sort of a, a response to stress. So did you find anything there? 
we did not look at terpenes in either Jacob or Andre's study. However, we are very excited to begin incorporating studies looking at terpenes in a lot of our research going forward. So um, we have a, an HPLC in our teaching lab. We also have now a new mini GC from Lucidity Systems, which is a CEM corporation. So that allows us to evaluate plants that we grow out and use in our courses for both the cannabinoid profile and their terpene profiles. I'm really excited to work with students on developing methods that are tailored to those machines. Our um, big testing lab on campus of our research analytical facility has a really excellent new GC system from Agilent, which is sort of sole purpose. I mean, you can use it for many things, but we will be using it solely for looking at terpene profiles in our research program here for hemp. So very excited to start looking at that more to see how stress may impact uh, terpene profiles or just regular cultivation practices could be influencing them or genetics. There's a whole bunch of different angles that we're excited to work on. Excellent. Okay. So thanks again for staying late. Um, but before I let you go, I do want to give you an opportunity to plug any website, social media, anything that people can do to get in touch with you or just follow what you're working on. Sure. Yeah. So folks can find me on the um, Cal School of Integrative Plant Sciences website. I am on LinkedIn. Also, it's a great place to connect with me. I would encourage folks to attend our field day in August in Geneva if they can make it. If not, uh, there may potentially be some recordings that could be made of that. Um, and there's always handouts from our field days that are posted on our hemp team research and extension page. If you just Google uh, Cornell hemp, you will almost certainly find that as the very top response on your page. And you will find all of our faculty who are involved with different areas of research and all of the many, many reports that we have been producing. So it's a great place if you're an industry member who's looking to partner with Cornell to get in touch with faculty who have expertise in different areas. I will also put out a plug for any industry members who are excited about working with our professional master students on capstone projects. All of the students who have worked with me in our professional master's program focused on hemp have done capstone projects in collaboration with industry partners. It's been a great success so far, and we're always looking for new ideas. All right. Excellent. All right, Heather, thanks again for joining us and sharing all the great work that you're doing over there in Cornell. And um, hope to see you soon. Maybe I'll make it out there for field day. We would love to see you, Ben, and anybody in the audience who can make it out. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Heather Grab. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, Conception Nurseries. Our next episode will drop July 6th. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, please do go over to canmedevents.com and check out our CanMed 2022 video recordings. Please also be sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Just search for CanMed Events. Also, we welcome you to contribute to our CanMed Community Facebook group. It's a great way to interact with other members of the CanMed community, including past speakers and fellow attendees. One last thing, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Doing so really helps the podcast reach more listeners, particularly the reviews. Each time we get new reviews, we see a bump in our rankings, which really helps us out. So we appreciate that. Okay, that's it from us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and please join us on the next CanMed Coffee Talk.